Morning, fellow Toastmasters. It's uh, Hard Lessons in the Skies is the name of my presentation today. We're coming up this summer on a, a rather a rather somber anniversary. It will be the 30th anniversary this August of Michigan's deadliest transportation disaster, the crash of Northwest Flight 255 in Detroit. Northwest Airlines Flight 255 was uh, a scheduled flight on August 16, 1987. It was an evening flight that was supposed to depart at about 8.30 p.m. from Metro Airport in Detroit. And August 16, 1987 was a, a, a sweltering summer day, and at 8.30 in the evening, it was still 88 degrees outside, and there were severe thunderstorms on their way into southeast. Michigan, which would wind up being uh, an indirect factor in what would happen. The flight was scheduled to uh, go to Phoenix, Arizona. And for the plane itself and the pilots, it was really part of a busier day. They started, uh, they'd started their day in, in Minneapolis and had flown from Minneapolis to Saginaw, then made the short flight from Saginaw down to Detroit, and after completing the flight to Phoenix, they were going to continue on to Santa Ana, California. Uh, that's, this sort of sequence is fairly standard in the U.S. airline industry, but what it means is that you have to get all of these things done on a very tight time schedule because the pilots will otherwise run out of the amount of hours they're allowed to be on duty and they'll have to stop for the day and really throw everything off. So that really created a, a recipe for them to be distracted, especially as severe weather moved into the Detroit area. The plane itself was, a, was this plane right here, an MD-82, and the MD-82 is the second generation of the, the, the kind of legendary DC-9 plane from the, from the 60s, and planes in this family are still they're still common today. If you fly on, on Delta Airlines, for example, which bought out Northwest about a decade ago. These flights are, these planes are still pretty common on, on mid-range domestic flights in the United States. It's one of the largest airliners of this configuration where the engines you see are in the back and the tail fin is up here on top as opposed to having the engines um, under the wings like they are on, on bigger planes. So this is an aerial view of what Metro Airport looked like in, in 1987. It's a little bit different today. The, the terminals have been replaced, and there are six runways now instead of only four. But um, Flight 255 was originally uh, intended to take off going from northeast to southwest on this runway here, going in this direction. But as the storm, as the, as the weather got worse and the winds changed, uh, air traffic control had to make a last minute change so that it would take off in the other direction, going from uh, southwest to northeast on this runway uh, right here. And what that meant was that as the plane pushed back from the gate at about 8.30 p.m., air traffic control was in the process of changing this runway assignment. And, um, because they were changing the runway assignment while the, while the pilots were beginning their maneuvers, it caused the pilots to get a little bit confused. As I said, they were already distracted by worries about falling behind schedule. And as they began to taxi, they got to this point right here, and they actually missed a turn and started heading in the wrong direction down the taxiway. Now, once air traffic control realized this, they, they quickly uh, radioed the pilots and corrected them, and the pilots turned turned around and, and got into position correctly. But again, this just sort of showed that things were a bit out of joint. 
But nevertheless, the plane got here to the, to the um, end of the runway and began uh, what appeared initially to be a normal, a normal takeoff sequence. But about halfway down the runway, say in, in this area, the captain noticed that his takeoff computer was incorrectly set, and he remarked on this out loud, so it was picked up by the, by the black box voice recorder. The first officer quickly reached down and made the, the correction on the computer, and the takeoff continued, again, apparently normally, but once the, once the, once the plane got towards the end of the runway, and lifted off, there was quickly a problem. Only six seconds after takeoff, the stall warning in the cockpit went off and the plane began to roll back and forth out of control. So here's uh, to the end of the runways right here. Right about here, the plane impacted, the, the plane collided with a light pole and then it collided with the Avis rental car building right here and finally rolled over on its back and, and crashed here, uh, just south of I-94 into Middle Belt Road. The result, as you might imagine, was catastrophic. The plane burst into flames and it disintegrated. The debris was strewn all up and down Middle Belt Road here. Uh, this is I-94 up here. This is the railroad bridge right here. And, and those are, this is all obviously still there today. Of the 155 people on board, 154 were killed, and an additional two people were killed on the ground. Somewhat miraculously, one person on board the plane survived. A four-year-old girl actually lived through this, albeit severely injured, um, but her parents and brother were among the dead on the plane. So um, an extremely uh, tragic sort of thing, as I said, by, by far the worst thing like this that's ever happened in Michigan, and it's, it's still one of the worst in American history. So the U.S. National Transportation Safety Board, a bit of a mouthful there, the NTSB, is the federal agency in charge of investigating plane crashes, and they showed up very quickly to begin looking at this and trying to figure out what had happened and what had gone wrong. A few things they were able to rule out pretty quickly. Um, there was some speculation that perhaps the weather had played a role, and only two years prior to this, uh, there had been a severe, a, a large plane crash in Dallas as a plane tried to land in a thunderstorm and a freak gust of wind took it down. But they were able to study the weather records from Detroit at, um, on this evening and determine that that had not been a factor, that those sorts of wind uh, events had not taken place. Another, specul another speculation that was made that there had been engine trouble. Some eyewitnesses reported seeing one of the engines of the plane on fire as it took off, but the investigators were able to recover the, the wreckage of the engines and from uh, forensic analysis determined the engines had been functioning normally. So what was going on here? Well, it became evident from the investigation that the fire that some people had seen had been caused when the wing hit the light pole, as I mentioned, that severed the wing and ignited fuel in the, the gas tanks located in the wing, and that burst into flames. And that's what people had seen. And when they studied the, 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 the way that the wing had been sheared off, they were able to look at the control cables inside the wing, and it became clear that the control surfaces on the wing called the slats and the flaps had not been in the right spot, which is a really severe problem. And to understand why that is, you just need to understand a little bit about what makes planes fly. Um, I won't go into the, the physics of, of how wind moving over a wing creates lift, but, but that's the general idea. But on a, on a plane of this size, uh, the, the MD-82 was designed to cruise at just over 500 miles an hour. And since a plane spends most of its time in cruise mode, the wing is engineered to create maximum lift when it's flying at that speed. Well, the plane doesn't take off going that fast. That would be insane. Um, the, the takeoff takes place 
uh, you know, between 100 and 150 miles an hour. At that speed, unfortunately, the wing won't create enough lift to make the plane fly. So there are control surfaces called the, the, uh, the slats and the flaps on the front and back of the wing. And, what, and these extend and change the shape of the wing to allow it to create the needed lift at this slower speed. So you can see here in cruise, it, it, when the plane's um, cruising, the, the flaps and flaps are in tight. Uh, on, on takeoff and landing, they're extended. And you can see this gap here on this diagram. You can see how they've come out from the plane and they've, they've extended the length of the wing. Since Flight 255 did not do this, that meant that the wings couldn't generate enough lift and it meant that the plane stalled and crashed. But how is it that experienced airline pilots could forget this extremely fundamental part of flying an airplane? Well, flying an airplane is uh, complex. Flying a jet airliner is particularly complex. And even the most experienced pilots don't just do it from memory. They work off checklists. And you can see here on this checklist, um, there, are, there are a lot of steps that are involved. And during the before takeoff checklist, um, actually during the taxi checklist, it says right here that they're supposed to set the slats and the, the flaps into the proper mode. But they didn't do that. And why didn't they do that became the question. Well, here's where a number of different factors started to come into play. As I mentioned, the captain had noticed during takeoff that the computer was improperly set. And that should, that, that, that should have been set during the taxi at about the same point in the checklist that the slats and flaps should have been set. And unfortunately, the point during taxi when they should have done that is when they were getting confused about what way they, what way they were going, when air traffic control had to give them better directions, and so they just missed that part of the checklist altogether. They just didn't do it. Well, it seems like planes wouldn't be very safe if something like that could just be forgotten about and nothing would happen. And in fact, there are supposed to be alarms that go off if the pilot tries if the pilots try to take off with the with the slats and flaps improperly set. But that alarm never went off. And they determined that the reason they determined that it didn't go off because, well, they were able to determine why it didn't go off by, by studying the electrical system of the plane. When the plane began to stall, a stall warning went off. And on this plane, when the stall warning goes off, it's supposed to go on in the cockpit in sort of stereo mode on both sides. And when listening to the voice voice recording in the black box, that didn't happen. It only, it only went off from, from one speaker. And by looking at the circuit breaker system of the plane, they determined that since the stall warning didn't go off in, in stereo, that meant that the electricity to the slats and flaps warning was off altogether. So it never sounded and it never notified the pilots that the plane was not safe for takeoff. Unfortunately, the NTSB could never figure out conclusively why the circuit breaker was tripped. It was possible that it was just an accident that, that no one had noticed because it hadn't come up. There was also a possibility that it had been shut off on purpose to prevent uh, a related false alarm problem that this plane sometimes had, but that, that was never able to be determined. So this is, again, as I said, a very, a very tragic story. But I think it's important to reflect on the fact that plane crashes are extremely rare, actually. These kind of catastrophic plane crashes almost never happen. And as the investigation in this case showed, they really only happen when a series of unlikely events all happen at the same time. There are a number of spots in here where the problem could have been easily solved, and a number of factors conspired to make that not work. So, for me, it makes me feel better about flying to know that there are all of these redundancies in place and that investigators are always looking for ways to make it even safer. But I can say that any time I'm on a plane, I always try and sit somewhere where I can see out the window 
and see the wings and make sure that the slats and flaps are in the right spot before takeoff. Not that I can do anything about it, but it makes me feel a little, a little bit better. So, there is supposed to be time for questions if anyone has anything. But is it, is it, it is. The light's really dim. It's on, it, it, it's red. So I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's so red. Oh, wow. It is yeah. hardly not even though. Best. Good job. Not, not, cards. You might want to pull the cards out and use the cards and instead. How long, did, how, how long though before the crash took place from the time the air, air crash took off? Um, the crash, was only a matter of seconds. Seconds? Yeah. Yeah, it's probably... Just blinking. Yeah, probably, probably 15 or 20 seconds. Some better, better than none. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The battery is used to so, uh, cool. Okay. Thank you. Take a minute out of the clock to go through and add the comments to your language. Good. So, I think. We didn't have this experience to work out during the American Revolution War, but they were definitely an issue for wars in the last century. If you read or seen the movie of the hidden figures, the hidden figures movie focuses on NASA and our, our race to go into space, but the book itself talks about a lot of things that happened a lot earlier, including the fact that the women engineers, the women computers, their math experts, were hired between World War I and World War II, and one of the things they did with NASA is a lot of aer uh, aer aerodynamic improvements. They had wind tunnels, and they had the engineers working there, and, and a, a facility right there that you could run and test things and then go back and crunch, have the women crunch the numbers and go back to the next It's a really good story if you have time to read the book as well as the movie there's a lot more information. It's covered. At this time we're going to introduce Fallon, or bring Fallon up to go over uh, the introduction for Cheryl's speech. And she will give us all the details on that and we'll see where we go over here. Cheryl is going to is working from her Advanced Communicator Silver Award book, project number three, and this is called Special Occasion Speeches. Today your project is the roast. Her objective is to poke fun in a particular individual in a good-natured way, adapt and personalize humorous, humorous materials from other sources, and deliver jokes and humorous stories effectively. Her personal objectives are avoid offending her roastee, who today is going to be Bridget, and use minimal notes. Her time is three to five minutes. Help me welcome Cheryl. Thank you. Bridget, if you want to be close by, or, I think it's good. How many of you enjoy roast beef? <laughs> we have any roast beef lovers? My, my mom right. makes it. How about roast turkey? <laughs> Haven't tried it yet. How about roast pork? Awesome! It's all good. Well, guess what? Today, you're going to have roast Bridget! <laughs> How many of you like roast Bridget? <laughs> For those of us who are parents <laughs> and have had children, we know a little bit about something about making excuses because of the children. The children make us tired. The children make us late. The children make us miss out on a lot of things. Well, Bridget, she uses the excuse of her five children, as she said earlier, she uses those for just about everything. So anything that happens, those beautiful five little children are to blame for that. So Bridget is often running late, you know, for work. So she gets to work, she's late, and she's like, oh my God, you guys must have left the clock on daylight savings time. <laughs> well, when that doesn't work, what do you think Bridget does? She gets a little indignant. All right, guys, what does, what does Bridget do? What is her fallback plan? 
her fallback plan are her beautiful five little children. Well, the employer is not buying that for too long. Bridget is also, she's a, the alumni, relate, uh, alumni director at Jackson College. So the children are always making her run late. Well, most of you don't know that Bridget gets behind in her household chores. She's got laundry, she's got a big house, thank goodness, she's got all those children. She's got laundry all over the place. Piles and piles of laundry. So one night, she's sitting on the floor. If you can just imagine these piles everywhere. There's piles on the stairs as you come down the stairwell. There's even a pile in the kitchen where it shouldn't be. So one night, she's sitting on the floor, Indian style, and she's playing a board game with her kids. They're having great fun, the kids are laughing, and then it's time for them to go to bed. So Bridget takes them up the stairs, tucks them in their, into their rooms, reads a nighttime story to them, and then she comes back down. She decides it's time to fold some of those clothes that she's got in those baskets. So she sits down to fold the clothes, and then all of a sudden, it happens. Bridget falls over into one of the piles and she disappears. <laughs> her family, she's so small, her family can't find her for two days. <laughs> and when she does finally show up, she falls out of the clothes, she topples out, tears streaming down her face, and she tells her husband, Brian, she's waving her little hand, guess what? It's all their fault. And then she blames the five beautiful little children. <laughs> and that sweet, sweet little voice of hers, we've heard speech after speech. How soft is that little voice? Her voice is so soft that when she calls the pizza place to order a pizza, what do you think they ask her? Little girl, is your mom home? <laughs> Maybe one thing you don't know is that Bridget, when she went in, how much does she love her shoes? How much does she love them? She loves her four inch heels so much that with each of her pregnancies, five pregnancies, she wore four inch heels. She even took it so far as to wear the heels into the villery room. <laughs> yes. And the doctor swore that maybe before they brought her in on the gurney that she had flown to Paris and bought shoes. She had shoes for the baby came out. What do you think the baby had on? Five inch stilettos! <laughs> That's how much Bridget loves her heels. So most of the things that happen in Bridget's life, she's done a lot of things. She's actually been a collegiate soccer player for Spring Arbor University. What do you think she was wearing when she was playing soccer? Her four inch heels. Her four inch heels! <laughs> Thank you! Bridget, Thank you for allowing me today to roast you and toast you in front of all of your friends and colleagues here in Toastmasters. And I would understand completely if you're a little indignant. <laughs>